Hello, everyone. Let me start with my screen share. Actually, no, let's... Um, the first thing is that some people here do not have their names set. I think it would be way easier for everyone if um, you could set a name that would enable yeah, more uh, um, so we can reference who said what. Then um, once this is done, I'm wondering if you would like to um, introduce yourself um, so far, it looks like most people already know each other. Uh, I don't know about the philo jitsas. Um, yes, okay, maybe let's not do that. Let's go straight to the workshop discussion. So I have prepared some slides that can be used as, um, as support for the discussion. Uh, but everything is going to be um, a discussion. So it's not like first I present and then we talk. So it's just a way for us to, to have a, a direction and make sure also that we don't get stuck in one topic only. So I'll be sharing my screen. And here we go. Can anyone confirm that this is shared? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yep. yep. Very good. So the agenda is pretty simple. Um, since I did not get too much feedback about what was more, more interesting for people, I kept it to one hour for trace-based testing and one hour for kernel testing in GitLab. I'm assuming that the latter is not going to be as uh, demanding. So if we have some time left over, we could go back to trace-based testing. Any uh, concerns with the agenda or something you would like me to add? I'll take that as a no. Can I ask Charlie to take notes about the discussions, Charlie Turner? Yeah, no problem. Sounds amazing. OK, so I came up with four categories for trace-based uh, testing. So the first one is, OK, so creating the traces, how it can be painful and, um, and slow. And uh, it's a little bit of an art. Then um, confidential trace execution in a CI infra is another topic that is, uh, well, important. Then the next one, reviewing frame outputs. So this is from a human point of view, like is the frame what it's supposed to be? And that's another art form of its own. And the last one is how can we uh, teach a machine to do that? <laughs> so this is pretty much research oriented at the end. But let's start with the easiest part, which is let's make traces. So. So there are multiple tools that allow you to make traces. So the original one was API trace. Um, so, well, it's good for OpenGL, OpenGL ES, DirectX 8 to 11, and there is DirectX 12 being added right now. Then there's graphics reconstruct, which is a Vulkan oriented only. Then we have render doc, which is not the same type of traces as API trace of graphics reconstruct. It's more like for a single frame but it supports uh, OpenGL and OpenGL ES, DirectX 11 to 12, and Vulkan. And we have uh, um, its maintainer in the call today. Then, so creating a trace can be difficult, especially in Steam, because there's multiple layers of um, and direction. So Steam is the one launching the game and things like this. So that can be a little tricky. I'm sure they are, like, we could uh, work towards making this easier. And then it can be super slow. Um, so it can be as slow as uh, getting frames per second, or in the most, most pathological case I had was more like a frame per minute, or per 30 seconds, really. And um, yeah, it, it makes reproducing issues extremely difficult. Then, 
Selecting the rele relevant frames is the next thing. Um, let's say you have a trace uh, that is about a minute of gameplay. You don't want to be looking at, let's say, 60 frames per second times a minute. So <laughs> that, that's quite a bit. Uh, you don't want to uh, compare that many frames. So you want to select which ones are the most important ones. So how do you do this? Well, you need to find what frames are the are the most representative of a scene, whatever could, could work. So as an example, I'm going to show the Tomb Raider, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider benchmark and how it can, uh, what can be um, used there. So first thing is you want to make sure that the menu is rendering correctly, because if your game is working, but you can't get there, that's, that's bad. So that's the first one. Then on, uh, so for the people who have not seen the benchmark before, then it's going to be a bit difficult to know what is going on, but I hope that it's going to be still uh, understandable. So I chose this particular frame um, because we could see uh, the protagonist from up close and having some mountain in the back, some snow, and that was the only frame of the benchmark where you could see her face clearly. So that's somewhat important in this um, I mean, it's not super important in the game, but it's important that the protagonist's face is there. Oops, sorry. Then uh, the next one is a bit more interesting because you get the metallic effect on the climbing gear, uh, the radio, lens flare. You can see some motion blur on the snow. And again, the, you can see the mountains and the fur also on the, on the, on the um, uh, jacket. Then you've got a new scene where you can see uh, Lara in a different outfit. So that's another thing because you don't want to check only in one place because potentially, well, uh, one outfit is going to be utterly broken and you wouldn't see. So as many outfits as you can uh, try to, to collect. And you can see some uh, god rays here. Um, then. Uh, some reflections in screen space, um, lens flare, things like this, and, and new uh, items here with the ice picks. Oops, sorry about this. And here, that's uh, again another scene with a flowing river, which we had not seen water before. There is rain. Uh, here you can see traces of rain drops and a waterfall here. So it's pretty useful. Very good. Um, any, I'm going to leave a pause here if anyone has some concerns or something they want to say about uh, creating the traces before we move on to TreeMate. OK. Then trimming, that's the, the first thing that everyone will agree is uh, problematic. So why, first of all, why do we want to trim? Uh, we want to trim traces because they are uh, super big, so in size, but also because you want to reduce execution time. Uh, I mean, why render frames that you're not going to be dumping? There's, there's no point. So uh, the problem is that removing empty frames can be very hard because frames can depend on previous uh, frames to render. And so there's been work done by uh, Collabora recently to improve the OpenGL uh, trimming. Then for Vulkan and Graphics Reconstruct, it's supposed to be designed for trimming, but then it's not been working super reliably for me. Hopefully, this is something that can be improved. And for DirectX, I've never tried. So did anyone try to do this? Crickets. <laughs> well, I think that's that's fair. Um, so, is anyone working on trimming or something related? I mean, we had Daniel Stone. Maybe he could talk to us about OpenGL uh, trimming here. Uh, I can. Go ahead. It's it's. So it's it's good enough for the traces that we already have, <laughs> and and it should work for for most Steam games. But uh, of course, we can find uh, corner cases that 
because uh, so we could make it a practical um, because the Azure case can take big servers uh, days. Uh, we had to to come up with some heuristics, and maybe we need to add a few more. So I don't know. Just uh, try it out if you want to add the traces. Okay, but this is really uh, so. So far, you only focused on OpenGL, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and who was that? Tomeu. Okay, of course. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, I guess for Vulcan, we'll need to see with Lunar G if uh, uh, if they are willing to spend some time on this. And for DirectX, I guess we'll see with API Trace how things are working. Okay, then next topic, infrastructure. So why do I say that we need to do like confidential traces? Well, the problem is that non-free games, which is the majority of the games in Steam, by majority, I really mean it. Um, the problem is that they contain non-redistributable art, like textures or videos or things like this, and and uh, traces are capturing that. So we don't have the rights to redistribute, so we should not redistribute it. So the problem is that they can be quite big, the traces, so uh, over a gig is about average. And so if we have, let's say, 100 traces that we want to run, and they are all uh, one gig, then it's going to take a while to download all your traces. So let's say over an hour, especially if you have multiple machines downloading from the same server. So what you want to do is cache these on the test machines um, so as you don't re-download it every time you start a job. The problem is that um, the machines can be used for multiple jobs. So we need the cache to be encrypted, or at least make sure that uh, only the jobs that are allowed to access the, the, these uh, traces need to be allowed. And uh, yeah, that's it. So the way things are done right now with uh, Free Desktop and Mesa CI is that the traces that are run are only the public ones, if I know, uh, if I'm right. Um, uh, no, 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 we are already using um, non redistributable traces for uh, Friedren only. And it works basically as, as you described. And there's a series of people who have access uh, via GitLab to, to, to the repository, uh, Minayo repository that uh, contains them. And that includes much the bot. So basically, the idea is that for uh, Fredrino jobs, uh, when they get uh, in a premerge testing, they can be tested with those uh, traces, but uh, the job is allowed to, to fail because who knows, maybe a contributor doesn't have access, isn't, isn't in that list, and we don't want to block the, the, that code from being merged if that person cannot de de debug it. But, uh, but the, the, those those people who have access could, in theory, I get them and and debug them. The only problem is that so far no bug has been found by that job. But it's only five or six traces. So so the infrastructure is there. We need to come up with more more traces and put them. Okay. And how do you store them locally and make sure that the other jobs don't have access to them? Locally, um, so there's a repo uh, which is not a public. It's in the graphics CI uh, namespace in, in GitLab. I, I think you meant on the actual DUT. Um, the answer is we don't. Um, so for most of, well, yeah, at least for our lava stuff, um, we don't trust the EMMT to burn out in, <laughs> like, yeah, we'd just kill it in a week if we actually wrote all of the full content into the storage so everything's pulled off nfs um that includes the traces where we've got an nginx caching proxy um so that will cache all of the content but it will only serve it if you've got a valid auth header like it um it goes and does a a head request i think uh to minio to check that 
the request is authorized. And then if it is, and it has been seen by the Nginx that we run in both the Collabra and in the Friedrino labs, um, then it serves it out of its local cache. So like, it's not as fast as being on the device, but it's at least Ethernet fast rather than internet fast. Yeah. So in the case of uh, the Valve Infra, so what I've been working on, we have so far about 60 trace, traces, like real traces, DirectX traces of real games, uh, where we get, I think out of these 60 traces, we have 220 frames that we extract. So one trace can actually generate more than one frame. And uh, as I was saying, the traces are big, so they are more than one gig. And um, one issue that, that we had with using NFS or something like this to uh, download the trace as we need, then uh, the issue is that potentially if you've got a network issue, it's going to influence your um, the execution. And that would make make it difficult to know if something is um, is failing, why it was failing. So as much as possible, we are trying to preload everything and then start the job. And when starting the job, the machine is basically freewheeling. And we only uh, get the uh, serial logs uh, to know what, what is going on. And if it is stuck, then we can reboot the machines or things like this. Um, I, I wonder if the answer then, rather than trying to do encryption where you then have to burn a ton of time decrypting it is um since you've already got things isolated via uh b2c um perhaps it could be about running a um uh yeah something like nginx or whatever that can do request validation um in parallel on the local machine there, serving from local storage, which the CI container wouldn't have access to, only when it's mediated. Uh, actually, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> so we found a solution already for this, and I, we are actually using the X for encryption. It's called FScript. So it's not just for X4, but it is there. So basically we can tell the kernel, hey, for this folder, you're gonna use this encryption key. And then it's gonna encrypt uh, both the content and the file names and, and, and metadata. And the only thing we need to do when we need to access this, uh, well, it's actually a Podman volume that we, we encrypt. The only way, the only, uh, thing you need to do when accessing this volume is you need to tell the kernel what is the key. And so basically we just need to send the key via the kernel command line. And this is stored in GitLab as an, um, a masked variable. So you don't see it in the logs and, um, and it decrypts things locally. And there's no, I mean, virtually no performance cost for this. Yeah. So we've tried to, we have tried to steer away from um, from static keys like that, partly because, you know, if you need to sort of add a new scope or extend the scope or whatever, then it gets kind of painful. Um, but also because it is easier to, um, to leak that key out into the log and then, you know, you not only have the, um, the content that's been leaked, but you have a a pretty persistent way to get at that content when you leak the key and unless you've got some elaborate <laughs> like rotation and distribution system um so yeah it, again that's something i wonder where um maybe where we're better served having having those keys stored more local to the content and then given out on demand when you supply an appropriately signed JWT because um, that's we've been using that for the private traces repo just so we can do a little bit more fine-grained decision on who should get them like at the moment the rule if I remember right um, obviously people with access can uh, can access that MinIO storage in um, 
in jobs from their repositories, but then also um, we, I think the rule for Mesa is that we allow merge requests against Mesa to pull them um, if the job has been triggered by Marge. Um, so it, it, it does let us make slightly more smart and sort of fine grained decisions there. Yeah. Um, so for us, indeed, the only access control that we do is when we want to mirror um, the cache, when we want to update the cache to the, uh, well, let's say like all the, the latest traces. So in boot to container, which for the people who are not aware is a project that we started, which is an init from FS. That is the minimum that you need to uh, run containers. So it just you know acquires an IP, um, formats a local drive um, to um, to cache everything, and so we can ask it to create. It, it's like a declarative way of saying what you want to have. Um, so you say, I, hey, I want a volume, and I want to uh, mirror. Uh, this particular minio, uh, I want it mirrored, like download the updates or pull on, and then there's a list of conditions, and then I want to push things back to minio, and again with a certain list of conditions, and um, um, and so this is when the access control is done, and rather than using JWT, uh, we have been uh, so we have something a bit like Lava that, um, so we call it the executor, which is basically doing time sharing between the machines. And this one is cre creating credentials that are tied to the lifetime of the job. And these credentials get um, uh, additional privileges sometimes um, if the, the client calling already has access to the, the traces and provides credentials then some of the, basically, the, if this, uh, these credentials that were provided are uh, belonging to a certain group, then we can add this group to the, to the dot uh, access right. So this is... But, sorry, when you say credentials that are scoped to the lifetime of the job, I mean, that's, you already get that from, from the JWT, right? Like it's, it's signed by GitLab and it has the, the job name, space, and project, the the user, the um, time based scope as well. In that. But the yeah, but the problem is the time was fifteen minutes, right? Right. So you can just stop it at any point. Whereas what we've done is really like at the second the machine is off, then the access cred the credentials are lost. Like uh, so, it's a bit more fine grained time wise. But yeah, then what you that that makes sense. I mean, there is there is the job ID, and you could query um, just to go check on the job status, and if it's, it's stopped, then obviously reject it. Um, like so, all of this makes sense. To be fair, um, I'm just seeing if there's a way that we can share more stuff between us rather than building absolutely. Out so the separate um... bits of info. So what you were describing, the JWT, for me, this is this was something that would be the credentials that you provide to the executor to prove that you have access to something. That would be a JWT uh, credential. So that would be again something that can be uh, well leaked and and uh, it would be rolled. Yeah, it's um, it's per job, and the payload signed. So even if you leak it, it's only it's only good for the lifetime of the job. Um, you know, the the valid only until field is by default uh, taken from the job timeout uh, plus when it started, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you could you could do an additional step where you pull out the job ID and you go query the job status and you don't allow it if the job isn't actually running anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Martin, Martin, if I may, um, I, I think the, the main difference that you are having with uh, what we are doing on the overall GitLab infra and what you're doing uh, at Valve is that you are willing to have a local cache for every trace for every runner. Um, 
while what Daniel just described is that you can actually rely on the entire infra to have access and to have the fine grain access to the to the various logs by using a separate machine that has a cache uh, that would be just an Nginx proxy uh, that would do the, the, the validation for you. So I, I still believe that what Daniel described is much easier to put in place um, because you don't need to have any identity provider or all this kind of stuff on top of that because the job already has the JWT token from GitLab, just needs to validate with the infra and then you get um, all you all you have and given that nginx is local to your machine but unless you're having uh, 100 machines in a one gigabit network uh, which i hope you're not um, it's not very it shouldn't help that much to have that instead of having local storage cache I definitely agree that if you can get away with not having a local drive and not needing to cache things locally, then this is way easier when you can have a, you know, a trusted and untrusted boundary um, that would be uh, separated by the network. Unfortunately for us, I believe that the traces that we have are way too big to download them and keep them in memory, for instance. Um, I mean, let's say that, so that we have some traces that are seven gigs. And if you have 16 gigs of RAM, uh, then, I mean, you're gonna run out at some point. And they are a bit more demanding than, you know, uh, GL Mark <laughs> or something like this. So. Yes, but you have, with B2C, you have the ability to have a local disk cache. Yeah. yeah. And you can actually just trash it after each job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, but then you would need to download, let's say the the 64. Uh, or right now we have about 65 gigs of uh, of traces for 60 traces, and so I mean, I think it's been taking about when one machine at a time was downloading it, it was about 20 to 30 minutes to download, and then of course if you've got multiple jobs in parallel, then that's going to be multiplying. The time so yeah just upgrade the switches <laughs> just 10 gigabit network <laughs> 10 gigabit for everyone <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it makes sense and like i do think there is a kind of a halfway house um but yeah i guess it'd just be nice to see you know even though there's the two use cases, right? Um, like one is we want to do upstream testing in Mesa of traces that people can see the output of, but aren't allowed to have the actual traces themselves because we're not able to re, uh, redistribute those freely. And then the other case is doing completely internal secret testing on traces no one can even know about. Um, so those are kind of different and yeah, I guess you're you're working at a different scale, but it would be nice to see if there's a way that we can reuse at least like 90% of the same infrastructure for both. Like even if you, um, you do end up um, distributing the store locally and you need to pull an encryption key, like if the, if the authentication mechanism to get that encryption key was the same for for both non-redistributable and um you know remote nginx um pulling of traces versus secret um and also local encrypted storage of the traces i think that'd be really nice rather than just building up two parallel worlds absolutely for for what it was um uh, I'm pretty sure Daniel, you, you know already about that, but uh, I've been checking on, on migrating uh, my new packet uh, into the new cluster. And while doing that, uh, I can't use the exact same infrastructure. Uh, one of the components that I need to add is Keyclock, which is an identity provider. And I wonder if we could not use that opportunity, opportunity to also provide some sort of um, private keys that way at the GitLab infrastructure so that you could really use directly uh, within your job. Like instead of 
instead of just saying, okay, let's put your um, private key in the CI variables, you would use the JWT token to ident to identify yourself with key clock, and then key clock would allow you to give you back uh, whatever key you want using the vault or using something else. Maybe that's something we can work on. Yeah, I think this was the recommended way by GitLab to uh, store secrets because the masked uh, variables that I think it was as um, help text around it, like, hey, if this is really something sensitive, don't put it there, put it in. I think it was key clock indeed. It's a, well, usually they, they suggest to use vault. Oh, oh vault, okay. But key clock is just the identity provider. It's not the, it, it's it's just a tool that allows you to say, okay, uh, I'm the job from GitLab. Uh, can I get something else out of it? And then you get this something else, this other JWT token to identify with any other components being Vault or being anything else. Mm -hmm. So the infrastructure that we are doing is something like Lava, where you have you would have the GitLab runner just basically queuing a job uh, in Lava. And so you, if you have 10 machines, you have 10 GitLab runners, and each of them is tied to one machine. This way, you can easily uh, stop pulling jobs from GitLab by just pausing the runner, but the machines are still available for running other things. Um, what we are trying to achieve is actually to have the same machines being available from GitLab or GitHub, and potentially other instances of GitLab. Um, so we're going to have a lot of different runners on the on the, the gateway, but then uh, they're going to all map to the same machines. So that's going to be an interesting problem. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's another part of the reason we're not building a whole ton of stuff like um, local storage into our Lava Lab because that's shared with kernel CI as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so this, this is the reason why um, we have a um, let's say like um, a very maintainable interface, basically at the client level, the client of the executor. And what we have been, uh, when designing the interface for the client, we've been thinking about how it would be used by GitLab and we don't want to be, you know, making it hard. So basically it's just a couple of secrets that need to be shared and how these secrets come to be we can, this is something that can be done purely on the GitLab side. And so we have not been uh, leaking abstraction uh, interface, um, abstraction, uh, fuck. what's the word? We don't have a leaky abstraction, basically. Uh, as much as possible, we're making it uh, airtight. So we have a local Minayo that is just used for sharing things in the infra, and this is not shared at all with, um, with um, free stop, and then if we want to put to send file to the machines, you download from wherever and you upload it through to to the local Minio, and this is done by the client directly. You just provide a folder saying, "Hey, share these files with the the test machine," and this folder is gonna be put on Min in Minio, and then the changes that are done by the test machine are gonna be downloaded back at the end of the job. So the interface is really just files and uh, and uh, STD in, STD out. Yeah, conceptually, that's pretty similar. Um, and yeah, I guess coming back to to Auth, like the main the main jump that something like KeyClick would give you as the vector for releasing secrets is that um, it does let you be a little more sort of fine-grained and discreet in how you do things rather than just every job in this repo can access this token at all times and that will let you decrypt stuff um so yeah that's similar to like vault or you know any other programmable like identity and secrets engine um yeah either way the I think the main thing is <laughs> probably just to to make sure that those secrets as much as possible um, are rotated. 
A, are rotated and appropriately scoped, um, but also B, like putting them in the kernel command line is fine as long as you're not <laughs> printing that command line straight back out, right? Um, and then the other thing is making sure you use them through files rather than command line arguments or whatever, because even though um, even though GitLab CI will uh, mask the variables for you, um, if you have a really unfortunately timed um, kernel message printed out or your UART drops one character out of the secret, then it's no longer masked because <laughs> it's not recognizable as the secret. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> hypothetically, definitely hasn't happened to us in real life. <laughs> yep. Sounds about right. But yeah, that's the, the issue that I would have with uh, um, B2C currently is indeed you put stuff in the kernel command line and, and this is leaked through, uh, or like basically every container has access to it. I've been thinking how to get rid of that. And well, I guess we could add an interface for boot to container to download secrets in files and then we would um, uh, mount them uh, in the different containers. Um, so that could be an interface, something uh, that, that would be nice to have. I'll put it as a to-do. What we, what we do there with Lava is um, we stick a bunch of per job environments, including the JWT into this pretty tiny root FS overlay. And the first thing that the um, uh, the job actually does is to, to pull the overlay. Yeah, um, I'm doing exactly the same with when I use boot container with uh, QMU. Basically, I'm just dumping all of the environment variable into a file, adding the file to the disk cache. And then whenever you start the container, um, within put to container, when you just say the command line for the container, you just say, okay, this environment, this environment file is the one you need to use. And whenever you boot your container, uh, you've got all of your variables already available, which means that you don't need to pass the variable along. Yeah, it's much. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that we've def definitely not been bitten by the fact that the kernel command line is limited to 2K. <laughs> and when you have as many environment variable as, mm, let's say, Mesa CI, then it doesn't fit. <laughs> yeah, but using using that file, I mean, if you just, so so for QMU, it's easy because I can open the, I can open the VDisk um, yeah. beforehand. Um, but it should be, it should be doable to have some kind of, I don't know, uh, I, Stall somewhere <laughs> viable file that you would uh, that you would pull whenever you run your your CI and you put that in the in the cache disk and whenever you start the containers then you just pull that file. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we have integration with Minio now, so you can download shit from Minio. It's fine. So that could be tied to your access privileges, and I could create two uh, buckets, one for the job. Uh, for the job file and one for the job secrets. And then I could have as part of the interface that the uh, AMP file needs to be named in a certain way and that it would be downloaded and um, put as an AMP file to every job that we execute, uh, every container execution. I would recommend not to enforce a specific file, but just let users to choose. Okay. They want to well, use. yeah. Okay. That's just, just my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, what you can do is just put the file in the volume. Yeah, you can already do it actually. If you, um, as I was saying, like in the client, you can say share this rep, uh, this directory, so you could have the environment file in the volume, and the volume is pulled before doing the container execution. So then you can just use dash dash m file and then. Uh, a volume. Oh, I don't know if we can actually use a volume slash, or if we need. To. You can. Yeah. Look at that, Podman. You're a good boy. <laughs> then, well, then, perfect. I, I mean, that's that's what I'm doing on QMU. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I have the dash volume 
and you can put whatever you want. It's just a regular file system. So yeah. Batman have visibility to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was afraid that they would force the end file to be on the local file system, you know, uh, as um, either a relative or um, an absolute path. And so you would need to uh, get the um, mount point of the volume. But then if you can use a volume name, then this is fine. Well, you need to have the mount point. Well, uh, then it's we can we can we can figure it out later, I guess. But yeah, and that's also something that we can easily patch. <laughs> yeah, I've been um, in the process of uh, making boot to container. I at first I tried to reuse Docker or Podman, but they were too big. And then I started making my own, and then I realized that actually uh, there was a way to get Podman to be small. So <laughs> I'm a bit more confident in hacking into Go now. Uh, not good at it, but at least I'm crazy enough to do it. <laughs> so yeah, and I guess this is something that would be upstreamable, which is what matters. OK, um, do we have something else on the topic? Because maybe we need to move forward. Um, yeah, if you. Can you uh, open at some point a GitLab issue on the free desktop, on the free desktop project, uh, with what we need, and so the people there can can also chime in and, and mm -hmm. publicly discuss about that. So in the end, we got some requirement on what's needed on the infrastructure, um, because even if you're running jobs, it would be perfectly fine for you to ping key clock if we have to install it on the infrastructure to to use the same infrastructure to to get there um, so we well, need requirements basically yeah that sounds good i i'll let charlie take note of that <laughs> thanks charlie <laughs> <laughs> uh okay so next thing reviewing frame outputs so that's going to be a game this is all about, as humans, we just want to look at frames and say, is it looking good or not? Because in the end, this is um, what you need to do when you get the execution, the results from the execution you need to know. So are we ready? Is this frame looking good? So we can see here some decal flying, which appear to be from a gun, which makes sense. I mean, it is an old game. It's zonotic. Um, reflections look fine. Yeah. OK. The well, color is a bit off. No, the color is also fine. Yes. Oh. But then you could see, like, oh, is, is this meant here? Hmm. Who knows? Then, well, uh, actually, it turns out that the head of this guy was missing. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the type of stuff where you realize only when having frames to compare. So here, what you can see is a diff with every pixel that is different is fully, uh, fully red. And uh, now, uh, on this frame, you can see how it's supposed to look. So here, the head is, is not missing. And here, the head is missing. Oopsie. OK, next. Is this looking good? Okay, well, here the shadows look fine. You can see the, the shadow through the, the leaves there, looking good. Well, this is looking a little odd, though. So, okay, and here is a bit more um, triangly than it probably would be in real life, but maybe the game is like this. Well, actually, that is the expected rendering. 
The previous one was uh, Windows <laughs> rendering this game, and this is the trace replaying on Red V. So congrats to the Red V developer, Red, Red v developers. So indeed, this is gone. Here we don't have these uh, very angly uh, artifacts. Let me go back. And if you look at the dog, it's also looking not as crazy. But OK, well, is it really that bad? Like, would it be breaking the game? Well, trust me, when it's behaving like this, yes. <laughs> it is really annoying to have this flickering. Uh, yep. So uh, too bad. It's, it's, it's not very playable. Luckily, this is a, a Windows driver issue, not, not Red V. But I wanted to check if it worked on Red V, so that's why I made the trace. Um, OK, then what about this? Like, what the bloody is going on? <laughs> it could be some uh, misrendering of vertices, right? And because I don't see a, a default character, or uh, the main character here, and then what's also going on with these things around there, like looks like a dithering pattern, but looks odd. Well, let's see it in context. Oh, OK, so ah, what the heck? Basically, what happens here is that the when the camera is being obstructed by objects, the objects become gets starts getting this dithering effect, and then the frame that was selected was basically covering completely the character. So, if you don't have the the video showing how it's supposed to be looking like, then you lose a lot of context. So that's something else that uh, to take into account when reviewing uh, frames. It's, well, it's difficult to know. And I don't know you guys, but I don't know every game in, in the planet. So, so possibly we would need to start thinking about recording the screen around where the frame is taken and have that uh, compressed. So for instance, this video is one meg. So it's basically doubling the amount of uh, storage per frame. But that could be acceptable because it makes review more possible. And then I don't know if it's possible to also have uh, not keep these videos for as, as long, or we would just store them somewhere else and not as GitLab artifact. Any thoughts on this? An additional benefit? Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure if that was super clear to all the participants, but you might want to uh, in increase your local like frame frame rate in the Jitsi settings, because the I think it's like five frames per second. <laughs> so. OK, so I'll, I'll select still frames then. All right. So here you can see the dithering pattern applied uh, when the camera gets close to the object. And this is why here you don't see it, but then you see it here when it's closer. And then for the explosion that we were looking at, basically, it's when the, um, the character is jumping on an animal, then there is this cartoonish explosion. And so it was not the character being exploded um, in a bad way. It was actually meant. Thanks, Charlie. So anyone has thoughts about potentially storing uh, small videos like this of, uh, of the frame in context? Uh, I May I? I'm not sure I understand uh, the reason if we have a uh, some reference frame which we know that rendered correctly. Well, that's a good point. Indeed, you could say that, hey, um, when you upload your, your frames, you upload a reference frame. And then in the description of the reference frame, you say, this is rendered as expected. Um, so it, it did not look wrong to the person who made it. And indeed, if it looks close to this, then that would be acceptable. Absolutely. But one reason why you might want to use 
a short video like this is that you could start using it to detect if there are some um, um, how like temporarily the coherent the output is so you don't have problems like oh yeah but here you, you maybe not see it I don't know if you can see the the light flickering in the curtains mm, no but I believe <laughs> yeah it's Okay, you have one frame here, and then I'll move to another one. Then another one. Basically, almost every frame is different. So here, for instance, you see a lot of light there, and then a bit before, you see the light has moved. So that's that's a bug, and we could do this sort of analysis, but then, yeah. So the idea is to store a small video and a handful of frames uh, in a trace itself. So we render not a single frame, but uh, like three in a row. And then we are able to compare temporal stability. Yeah, it's something like this. Hmm. Yes, makes sense. I apologize for the time question, but I'm kind of lost in what you want to achieve here. Because as far as I understand, you've got your plot the trace. If you have the expected trace, Basically, you just need to do the pixel difference between the two, right? So when we need the video to be pulled, somebody? Um, Why? So that's, yeah, sure. Um, the video could be useful to bring context for the, the person reviewing. Um, if indeed there are very few differences between the different GPUs, then you're good. You can just have a reference frame and see how close it is. Uh, we're going to have a section on on, on um, doing the frame comparison. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are some possibilities. It's just that from um, basically, like, what are you testing is, is the question. If, if there were not, I mean, if the rendering was off, but then it was consistently off, then like, would I have cared? Maybe not. So, so um, selecting frames is good, but then you're gonna just be looking at this particular frame. If at this particular frame the output was fine, then you will never know. Whereas this would bring a bit more uh, context, and potentially you could have way longer playthroughs, and uh, and and find more issues than uh, just what you would have found in a couple of traces. But yeah, you're right that the context was missing definitely. Um, so, as far as I understand, uh, I mean, that's what I understood. Those CI traces are used in the CI, mm -hmm. so they are used by a computer. Yeah, so, uh, okay, maybe let, let's go to the automated frame reviewing then. Well, not, not necessarily, uh, but, but, but it's mostly that uh, I understand that there is a need to put some video in the context. Uh, but besides the fact that this is a nice practice to have, and this would help developer to understand that there is a difference. I, I just I just need to know if it's what exactly you want to achieve there. And if the question is, do we have the space to upload those or not? <laughs> That's the main question indeed. Like, can we? And do we just keep it for as a ref, um, like basically from the reference frames? We would also have the reference video so we can somewhat look, but then we don't generate for every single run. The, um, the output uh, video, which would make sense. Um, I, the reason why I put the video was just in in the uh, basically in the context of the talk. You needed to see how things were looking, um, and then that just led me to think, okay, maybe there is actually some value in in having that. But knowing what we need and what we don't is is basically where we are now. It's it's research. Uh, we need to know what we need and uh, if this is going to catch things or not, all the problems that we want to catch and, and all this. So maybe let's just go to the automated frame reviewing, and uh, which is way more actionable right now, at least. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> take that as a maybe. <laughs> Okay, so 
For uh, automated frame reviewing, um, we have some challenges. Uh, one of them is that the frames are not necessarily, well, let's say you have a single trace, you run it on multiple GPUs, you're going to have different outputs. And that would come from, let's say, if the driver is the same, you're, uh, it's just the hardware being slightly different in the way it, it's going to uh, run the different shaders. And um, like even temperature can have an effect on, on the output uh, frames because of floating point precision. Um, the order of operation in the floating point is, um, is I mean, if you do like A times B times C or A times C times B, you're going to get a different result potentially. And, um, and so, depending on the, or, I mean, these operations can happen between shader executions uh, using, for instance, uh, um, what's the word, atomic operations, or simply because you write back the results in a, in a buffer somewhere. And so this is going to have effect, uh, some effect on either the, uh, the vertices or the fragments. So basically, the actual pixel color, or um, of inside geometry, or just the edges, basically. And um, so let's have a look at some of the issues. So here we can see a diff between two GPUs for the same frame. Um, so what is interesting here is that there are so the purple color means that the pixel is different. So the vast majority of the pixels are actually the same. But then we can see these uh, banding going on there and then a dithering pattern on it. That's, well, the dithering pattern can be different depending on the hardware. And uh, it might also be done in, in uh, a shader if they want to do that there. And then usually you can see around some of the geometry, there's going to be a lot of different pixels. Uh, and um, what well, that makes sense, because if uh, actually for the geometry, this one is a bit better. So here you can see sh shit, right? So let's say this big blob here or here. Um, the reason why it is like this is because this is animated geometry. Uh, that's grass. So very slight differences in the position of the, um, I mean, the grass is animated using vertex shading or geometry shaders or tessellation or whatever you want to use. And so slight differences in the vertices position that is calculated by the, these uh, shaders uh, is going to affect uh, the where the edges are. And when the edge moves, then you can have enormous differences. Let's say you had an edge that was black uh, on a white background, then you could have literally uh, go from black to white. So you can't just say that throughout the image, a couple of, uh, if you can have a plus one or minus one on the you know, every component of every pixel, and that would be acceptable. Uh, this wouldn't work for something like this. Um, I'm going super fast here because I, um, it's uh, almost time to start with the kernel. So do you have any uh, questions here or additional insights? So I have a question. If mm -hmm. nobody, how do you do today with those traces? Because those traces are used uh, in CI in Mesa. Um, how is it working? So, so for the for the Mesa ones, um, all we do for those is we check the checksum of the produced image against a YAML expectations file. Um, if that varies, then we throw an error. Um, you know, there's no, there's no allowance for, yeah, like small margins because we just can't really reason about that. Um, for the comparison, we have all of the, the gold images in a particular MinIO bucket um, indexed by checksum. And then, Whenever a trace fails, we 
upload as an artifact from the job um, the the failure result and then um, so Piglet produces um, Piglet produces HTML for the entire trace run and when you click through that we embed some some JavaScript that uh, takes the two images um, compares desaturates and then overlays the um, the error region so you can kind of see them side by side as well as um, what's actually changed. Actually, if I may add something, <clears throat> so the idea is not as much as if the person can figure out if the, if the image looks good, but rather if, if any change in rendering was intentional or not. It gives an opportunity for the person committing that code to figure out if there's any, in a, uh, any change in rendering that, that wasn't known. Um, then, well, if a person can look at the div and figure out if, yes, that's what I intended to do, then the checksum gets updated, and, and that's it. Yeah, you are absolutely right, and I guess this is a slide that I forgot to write. <laughs> I was hacking on them until right before the, the well, this um, um, discussion. So let, let's go through first the, the list of ways we could do this. And then um, then we can talk about how to integrate this with pre-merge and things like this. So the comparing to known good frames and just using checksums is, uh, is working great for uh, post-merge. And uh, we can have review, uh, humans review the new frames. And it's OK for pre-merge as long as the output of your frame is going to be constant. But if you have any variance, which is pretty much like any immediate mode renderers that I've seen, um, then it doesn't work for pre-merge because let's say that you would, um, let's say you have three different outputs uh, possible for a frame on a particular GPU. In pre-merge, you're going to see that, OK, the frame has changed and the new checksum is going to be this. And let's say you review the frame like we were trying to do before and say, OK, it looks good or nothing too bad looking. Then you say, OK, well, I add the, sh the, um, uh, the new checksum and then you land the code. But then at the next run, you're going to have another uh, checksum. Then, oopsie, everything breaks down. Yeah, well, if 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 the um, if the results aren't stable, then uh, one cannot use that. It's it's a flakiness. Uh, why why would we have three possible outputs for the same image if it's not because of arrays or only find uh, behavior? Um, so that was what I wanted to show here. Um, so when you have more complex geometry, for instance, and the um, especially when you have something that, that is a recurring process, for instance, um, uh, well, the grass, I assume that uh, the position at uh, time t is taking the position at time t minus 1 as an input, so the error is compound. And the uh, potentially, if you have collisions between the, the blade grass, then there's going to be some, uh, well, a bit of chaos, really. You know, tiny little changes that compound and make a huge error later on. And you can't, I mean, you can't go around this. The shade, the execution of uh, um, each shader on every core is not guaranteed to be the same at every single run. So you cannot assume that it's going to be always like this. For some simpler GPUs, it might be a valid assumption, but at least for Intel and AMD GPUs, uh, this is um, this is an invalid uh, assumption. But yeah, if we're working with the traces uh, and uh, collisions, uh, so the collisions are made in general in the engine and the CPU, right? So if we are working with the traces, we, we there shouldn't be any issues with uh, these things. If you're using the CPU, yeah, but I don't believe that they're using the CPU for everything. 
at least physics. So you honestly. mean in the traces there are things computing collisions and stuff like this? Yeah, that could be. Okay, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> So it's likely something to do with order of the execution of each, uh, like yeah, uh, yeah. shader instance. Yes, like we could process uh, one vertices in one run and other in an in another yeah. run. Yeah, and that could be due to let's say I, I was saying that thermals was there and that I, I didn't finish the list. Guess why? <laughs> um, so let, let's say that if you are, uh, it's a little hotter in this particular day that you run the trace, uh, potentially you're going to throttle down the, the cores, which means that your bottlenecks are going to change. Your memory bandwidth is suddenly going to be a bit more, uh, a bit higher. So you're going to be stalled for we uh, less time and potentially your context switching is not going to happen at the, um, um, you know, like for the waves. Uh, and so there's so many things that can affect this. And basically, if a shader invocation depends on the output of another shader invocation, then potentially everything will go to shit. And well, the reality is that for complex games, there's a lot of this. And, and then, well, the output is becoming a bit more unstable. It still looks good. I mean, this looks fine. But then you're not going to have pixel accuracy. And GPUs have never been marketed as being pixel accurate. Heck, if you land an optimiz optimization pass, you're going to change the output. Because of, as I was saying, like A times B times C is not the same as A times C times B. It's close enough, but it's not necessarily the same. Is that um like does it make sense? Yeah, I guess it doesn't make sense to to do trace based testing with those traces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a very good point. I wanted to give you um, a per trace uh, analysis of how much um, variance we get uh, on all the different GPUs. I ran out of time, but I have the data, so I should have it uh, like during the conference, so I can I can come back with it. I uh, what I can say right now is that um, so wait a second, someone is uh, not muted. Okay. Um, so what I can say is that there's a 20% chance right now that a new frame being generated is going to be known uh, is going to be a new one. Yes, that was it. 20% chance that it would be a new one. So one every five or six uh, is going to be a, a, a new unique frame that we've seen. And that's on... Uh, about 6,000 frame outputs that we have for 220 uh, different uh, uh, frames um, in a trace that call expected outputs. So if every GPU had the same amounts, then we would have 220 uh, deduplicated frames, but actually we have something like 2,000 of them. So this 10%, uh, uh, well, never mind. Uh, anyway, this. There's a lot of variance. It's not up for debate. <laughs> there's, there's very few GPUs that render the same output. That's that's all I can say. And OK. Uh, yeah. So yeah, in light of this, um, do we really, really so I, I see variance modeling uh, with, uh, yeah, where, where the image changes is something you mentioned later. So is, is this complexity really required if we add just I don't know, uh, uh, an epsilon of uh, pixel changes that were allowed uh, in the whole image, would it be enough? Or do we really need like locality information? Like this this part can change and this other part cannot change. Yeah, I think I think you need locality because if you go to um, that example of the grass where just the geometry has changed, like that's a pretty, a pretty giant delta. Um, and if you added 
enough for that, then, you know, you could be missing the grass entirely or, you know, missing complete trees or something. So I think, I think we definitely need something more rich to describe it. I just don't know what that is. Um, Cause yeah, a lot of, a lot of what we end up seeing um, is stuff like either missing geometry or broken blending or something like that, where it can be relatively small, but still pretty high impact. Amen to that. <laughs> I mean, if you remember the, the original issues there, uh, like the missing head, it's like most pixels were fine. But um, yeah, uh, as soon as you've got geometry having issues, I'm sorry, as soon as you've got geometry having issues, then you can't expect that a small delta would be acceptable. Um, because as I was saying, if you've got a black edge or let's say a black triangle on a white background, then uh, potentially you are gonna have a slight change in one vertex, uh, vertex position and suddenly your sample is not gonna be on the triangle anymore, it's gonna be on the background. And how much of a delta is that? Well, 100%. <laughs> so, so if you could encode which pixels, like basically or around every edges, you're allowing a lot more changes than you are um, in, for instance, the sky there, then, then that would make a lot of sense. But do you agree that if, if you have a, like a floating error sample, uh, floating error, in your vertices, and suddenly your vertices gets moved by one pixel. What matters is the locality of the pixel. So I, I was half joking in the chat. Um, can you just remove the bump of those error batches? Just done sampling the image, compare it with the done sampled image. That should basically give a an average of each pixel. Um, so you know that okay. There is a tiny offset there, but it's acceptable. And then you can also compare the full image for the, the things that are actually different. Yeah, in a way, it's what you're describing sounds like a 2D convolution, verifying basically that the geometry is matching pretty well between the, the frames. That sounds like a possibility. Um, I'm sure that it would get a, a very, you know, like a value, but the problem with the, these convolutions is that there's no unit, so you don't really know like, well, you could say like, what is the optimal using auto convolution, but then I don't know. It, it In any case, I think we can agree that this is all research. And what we are building right now is a database of frames that is manually tagged as being acceptable or not. And once we have this data, then we can start making algorithms or, or try different algorithms and uh, see which ones are working. I mean, everything we're going to do is heuristics. And, you know, if uh, if people want, want to try their hand at, it, at this, then we would have a data set. And I think this is the best we can do. Uh, what, what do you guys think? I think that's where also uh, the the context the context of the trace comes into play because like uh, with such instabilities, interframe instability becomes more important. Like if mm -hmm. this grass would jump around between frames too much, exactly. Like that's, that's something that would, yeah, and we would not be able to catch it just by looking at one frame. Yes. Well, you read my mind. <laughs> it's, I mean, there is also truth in what Tomio was saying, like, pick better traces, bitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, but this is also something important. You don't pick, like, you know, areas without grass because you want to know if the grass is working. <laughs> or you, you want to also check that your water is working. So it's like, it's real life, it's annoying. Yeah, I think it makes sense, but 
I also think it's possible to do this incrementally, like start with the simple stuff. And uh, as we add more traces that uh, have this weird uh, graph, graph stuff, uh, we can uh, improve our system. Absolutely. This is aiming to that. And I would propose that whenever a new trace we add, uh, we basically use it only for post-merge, build a, a model of the variance, and then if we see that, you know, like uh, once basically the trace proves itself in this particular GPU, that, you know, it's reliable enough, then we can use it for pre-merge. But we'll need to have these two stages. And if a particular trace is tricky for pre-merge, then what do we do? Well, we just improve our variance modeling or or find other uh, ways of detecting this and uh, blah, blah. And in the meantime, the trace is not affecting pretty much. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I mean, even before post-merge, if you just want to find pure environmental variables, then, you know, just queue, it, queue those traces up to run like a hundred times a day against the same build of Mesa and the same kernel, right? And, see what falls out of there because um when you when you go to post merge you're introducing not only environmental variants but like you know small near optimization variants or whatever that is true but then this is also something that humans wouldn't necessarily care about the output the, the slight output difference and so we don't want to be focusing too much on stuff that don't matter and yeah, if we, yeah. so, uh, so i agree but i think it, it would be helpful to just have it isolated so yeah the you know temperature load whatever um variance you were mentioning like if you could model that first and separately then that gives you a pretty good understanding of you know, these are the bits that do just change. And it's not because we've optimized things slightly differently. It's just that they'll never be the same. Yeah. The difficulty is that the machines need to be used uh, also. So I don't know. Uh, so what we've been thinking about is creating an enrollment process. So whenever there's a new trace we want to see where it's runnable because not every gpu can run every trace if there are some features that are missing for instance and as part of this enrollment process we could uh, try to run the trace like 10 times uh, on always the same uh, mesa version and that could be uh, giving us at least a good idea about well if it is not somewhat stable then it would be uh, one out of 10 times or one out of 100 times uh, that where it would be problematic. Hmm. But yeah. yeah, but that will still not address the issue when uh, you, you land the compiler optimization or something. But yeah, it would be a good start for random GPU stuff, yeah. hardware stuff. In the end, I think what what would be the goal of this automated frame reviewing is to have um, a reference frame including where we are accepting some changes and this would work for every GPU and then this way we can uh, just add a new GPU and then and then have the reference frame already there so that means that adding machines to CI when you add a machine to CI you don't need to uh, suddenly review 200 different frames uh, not frame different traces so that's potentially 500 frames and, and compare them to all the, out, the other outputs because that's unfeasible. So we need to uh, think from a human perspective, are they looking close enough? And um, yeah, so that's going to be an important thing. This needs research. <laughs> okay, but I think we will have to go now to trace by uh, kernel testing. I think we are at uh, 20 minutes over time. Um, OK, so unfortunately, I ran out of time for kernel testing. So I just have a couple of opens. Um, does anyone have any other open uh, than these?
Okay, so let's see if something comes up. So I have a question for Daniel Stone and, and Benjamin uh, Tissoir. Can everyone now use GitLab for the kernel tree? Because a couple of uh, months ago, that was uh, that was not recommended. Um, and I'm wondering now if this is OK. I wouldn't say everyone just please clone this particular repo and go for it. But we can definitely see uh, people using it one by one. Um, we already in we are already starting the nouveau guys to use GitLab and submit merge request. Um, I think AMD is already using that too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so it's fine um, as long as suddenly there is not not an announce on one of the LKML that says just please use GitLab for everything. Uh, and <laughs> everybody starts on that. And that. Yeah. Um... Fredrino's there as well. I think those smaller trees are completely fine. Um, the ones that worry me are obviously DRM tip, DRM misc, and also DRM intel, um, since that has about a bajillion CI pools per day. Um, but yeah, for, for the smaller ones, I think it's fine. Like We seem to be scaling pretty well. Um, hopefully the storage is in pretty good shape now. Um, so as long as we don't DOS it from day one, but we can just ease in a little bit, I don't see the issue really. Well, that well, is that good is. news. Um, okay, well, that, that settles it, I guess. Um, and then we can prove first that things are working for smaller drivers and then grow towards <laughs> DRM tip. But I agree that this is going to take a while. Are there any resources somewhere about how this uh, workflow should look like with GitLab used with kernel tree? What is the process for submitting patches for review? Whether we have hybrid mode for developers to work with, with mailing lists or we use mailing lists only and there is just some data pulled into GitLab? How does it work in practice? And uh, what is the plan to you know convince developers, developers. to switch? Um, I don't. I don't think there's any good answer to to hybrid mode because all of them fall into an uncanny valley. Like, um, you know, you're for sending out from GitLab to mailing lists and people. Everyone's going to immediately complain that it's HTML mail, and then um, for people sending back in. Um, from mail to GitLab, it's people are going to complain that you know it's not in the right place in the UI and it's disjoint and breaking threads and all of this. Um, that was one of the things for Mesa originally, is that everyone really wanted a hybrid mode, but no one could really figure out how to make it work. Um, as far as how the workflow actually happens, yeah, it's there's definitely nothing mandated, and we don't really have a particular best practice we can point to either. Um, but that's exactly what the Novo people have been doing, is um, trying to try out a few different models of, of workflow um, and how that would integrate with things like, yeah, handling pull requests and, you know, pulling patches in from the list and getting them up there. Um, that's all the stuff that they're trying to figure out at the moment, like how how would this actually work in practice? So I would probably look at what they're doing and, and go speak to them and ping them as well. Yeah. I think ultimately we don't need to like migrate the, the workflow at all at first. Uh, we can just switch uh, from git that free desktop that org to GitLab that free desktop that org and just change the git URLs and not change anything else. And this should already give us some CR post merge at least. For, for what it was, um, I know that uh, at Plumbers uh, next week, I think, um, one of our fellow colleagues uh, is going to give a presentation of uh, how we switch to GitLab uh, for the rail kernel. Um, we did not use the 
same kind of like incremental process. We switched directly from using a, a mailing list to GitLab over a couple of months. Um, but I think the, the main thing is that there is no, as everybody is saying, there is no right way of doing it. It's much more depending on the maintainers, uh, how they want to handle things and if people are getting comfortable enough in merging stuff. Um, so yeah, the nouveau approach is, is good because they are testing things. And as long as everybody is in is okay with that up to Linux in time of does Linux accept merge requests from Dave that has been uh, through um, Benzgex and that have some non-maintainers, non-official maintainers playing merge request. Uh, I think we are fine there. We can do things incrementally. But my concern with this is, let's say that someone is sending um, uh, a pull request or trying to change the, the an internal interface of the kernel and has to send patches to pretty much every subsystem, then it's also unreasonable to ask every, well, these people to create an account in every single uh, GitLab instance or GitHub instance that um, that would be the canonical one for the project they are actually merging uh, into. So I think we'll have to have some sort of um, hybrid way, but maybe what could be done is that the maintainer takes the patches from the main list and then makes a merge request directly and have CI run there and then merge using the merge button. So I don't know what you guys think about this. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> effectively already what happens today, right? Like you know, massive list discussion happens and then at some arbitrary point the, the maintainer goes through and applies and merges and yeah, I don't really see a way around that. Yeah, so there's always going to be a hybrid mode, that, that was my point, but I guess the core contributors to a project can be expected to, to, to make merge requests on the project directly and not, um, not um, just send patches to the main list. I mean, there's definitely some overlap between um, like things like display and sound, for example, or I don't know, GPU and memory management. Do we really expect the sound and memory management maintainers to come to GitLab every, every once in a while to check if they have some reviews to make? That is a very good point, reviews. Well, there is, um, okay, actually I have an answer for this. Uh, in GitLab, you can um, subscribe to notifications for any new merge request. And so just like you would uh, subscribe to a main list, you would just subscribe to this. And so then you get in your email, uh, uh, well, in your emails, you can see what is going on there, but then you might not want to have updates on every, well, I don't know. I guess it's up to you. GitLab is pretty good for this. You can choose what you want. Yeah, but I mean, it's not just like making sure that, um, for example, Dave and Linus are happy about it. It's also a bit wider than that. Uh, yeah, you have to make sure that the sound and memory management are happy about just like just even just signing in into GitLab and making sure that they'll get notified. True. Yeah, I think I think whenever you have a cross um, a cross subsystem merge request, you can't use GitLab for that. Uh, mostly because the maintainers they don't have access, they don't necessarily have access to our GitLab instance. They could create uh, an account, but we don't require people to create accounts um, unless there is a kernel.org, gitlab.kernel.org, where everybody is going there. I don't think we can uh, expect people to send cross subsystem merge request. Um, they would have to. Yeah, I, I think kernel.org is taking kind of a separate direction. Um, I think Constantin is actually working on having some kind of bot or something to send mails from pull requests. Um, he said he was working on something like that, so maybe Maybe that could be like the bridge that we are missing somehow, but I don't know. It's, 
it's actually funny because everybody in every company is doing the same thing. They are all <laughs> write, write, writing on a board to actually uh, make a bridge between merge request and mailing list. We have a bi-directional bridge. It's a nightmare to maintain for what you're worth. <laughs> but with GitLab, I think you can, we could create an account that basically is using the main, the uh, original mailing list as a, um, yeah, uh, yeah, and then every time there would be a merge request, then basically the emails would be sent there. Yeah, the problem I, I is think, that as I, soon I as you have. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I just I just want to emphasize what we what we currently have on on our bot. Uh, it's a bidirectional bot. Basically, whenever you whenever you open a merge request, it creates a uh, batch series on the mailing list, and whenever you submit a batch series over the mailing list, it creates a merge request. But then. When the bot creates the merge request, does the bot has to also send the merge request to the mailing list? And so you need to have a database to ensure that what you are doing is correct and that you're with who sends what. Uh, so it gets messy really, really easy. And um, yeah, it's it's not it's not easy. And I would suggest that we can actually trust developers to do things properly. Like if you're just touching your subsystem you can definitely send out a merge request but as soon as you need to touch another subsystem you have to go through the regular ways i yeah. also don't think that the problem is creating accounts because other maintainers maybe just don't want to and then they say no send emails yeah basically yeah, we have we have to adapt to the other maintainers. OK. Um, well, that's a very good discussion there. And I'm sure that, indeed, like everyone has been working on bridges. For instance, myself, I have been making a, um, a bridge so as every time there would be a merge request. Oh, no, sorry, like patches sent uh, to a mailing list it would create a merge request, not a merge request, just a pipeline in GitLab for testing. So it, it just does that. So use GitLab for just testing, and you keep on using um, the uh, main list for uh, submitting your patches and doing everything there. So that's the, the least commitment to GitLab, and we just use GitLab for um, running tests. And the bridge is bi-directional in the way that once GitLab is done executing the pipeline, it reports back. So um, I wrote the code. I need to uh, finish uh, merging it. I just need more testing, basically. And um, and this is something that, uh, that at least uh, the patchwork maintainers were uh, willing to land. Um, the reason why I made changes to patchwork is because I wanted to Make sure we never drop a patch series, and, uh, because there are if there are some network issues, you can easily uh, well drop some some emails. So that could be problematic. Um, but let's maybe move on to where do we store the GitLab CI YAML? Because like, do we want it in tree? I think Michelle Dancer was uh, uh, an advocate for this. Uh, is he here? I think this was discussed with uh, Daniel Vettel a while back, and uh, he said just drop them inside the drivers, DRM, something like this. OK. Yeah, I, I was actually part of the discussion because I was playing around with that for Novo. And maintaining it out of tree is quite annoying and problematic because you don't get the nice GitLab integration because in the other repository you will want to change your pipeline, but you can't verify it actually works. Um, it's basically a nightmare to maintain because I had to, you know, adjust the Novo project and point it to my custom CI file to check if it actually still works or not. So entry is really the only option here. So is it possible to tell GitLab to look for the YAML file inside the subdirectory or something? Or do we really need uh, .gitlabci.yaml at the root? It can uh, be that's anywhere. possible. It can be in a subdirectory or a different repository as well. OK, so should work fine. Can you 
can even have a different name. <laughs> you can <laughs> you can use food at Yamari Parks. True no that. We'll never know. <laughs> Um, okay, so now the, the next question is going to be, like, what do we want to test? I'm sorry, the dog is uh, <laughs> crazy. Um, because, I mean, let's say that we would like to test, oh, okay. What should we test as in which main lists or which projects? And then what do we run for each project? I think what the Nouveau tree, what Carol has been working on, was at least basic, uh, basic compiling, basic check patch, uh, ensuring that um, I don't think you introduce a sparse, uh, but these are the two, three things that you basically need. Uh, having a a boot run would be nice. I think we can do that through QEMU, at least to ensure that the kernel somehow boots if there are changes outside of the DRM code. Um, then it's entirely up to the various people managing the CI, their own forms, if they agree to see more testing. I mean, once you, you get into boot testing, that's sort of exactly what kernel CI is for. Um, I think the, the main problem with kernel CI though is responsiveness. Um, it's always been very much a, you know, you you push your tree to Git and at some point in the next 24 hours, you probably get a bunch of results, but not necessarily. Um, so I think in terms of pre-merge, that would be the hardest thing to, to cross because no one's farms are really set up for providing them um, real-time responsiveness with kernel CI, which is, to be fair, the, <laughs> the only reason we can um, uh, do Mesa CI is because we really aggressively prioritize it over kernel CI, and kernel CI basically just runs when idle. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the main thing, is that the results come back really on a, a best effort um, basis from all the farms that are there. Yeah, when we were working at Intel, I was uh, making sure that the latency of the results uh, would be bound. And uh, when whenever it would get out of bound for whatever reason, then yeah, developers would freak out and not be happy about it. And yeah, that that is very important, the real-time requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then like everyone's just used to um uh almost zero reliability as well in terms of the or availability i suppose um so quite often you'll see results just go missing for a month for a particular class of device and they're like oh yeah yeah my lab went down so i just turned it off and then you don't know this unless you're specifically looking for it so um yeah i think unless and until we can work with the kernel CI people to um, have something that could work better for us or figure out a workflow where, you know, rather than doing it in line with GitLab CI, we'd sort of kick off a whole host of um, requests to kernel CI and just have something automated that collates it, say, four hours later or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it makes sense to build out all of our own hardware farms and duplicate all that effort, but until we find a way to bridge that gap, then we're just stuck with QMU, really. Well, that's an interesting take. Um, I would not have, I, I, I'm not sure trusting someone else to maintain the machines for a project is a good idea, especially since you know, let's say for Nouveau, there's going to be new GPUs that you want to add or uh, things like this. And having access to the farm is, is pretty crucial. And my experience with having, uh, let's say, contractors or uh, outside technicians that are not really into your project 
deal with the machines, it's it's a disaster. There's, there's just no way around it. Um, it never worked. And um, even when automating pretty much absolutely, I mean, pretty much everything you can, if they don't have a vested interest in the project or if they don't have, I mean, <laughs> actually, this literally in the, the, the the farm that that we have and that is maintained by some um, external contractors. They I have a, a, on the screen a list of self checks, and if the machine was not, I mean, the, um, in a couple of days ago they uh, did some changes uh, at our request, and the machine was not on, and they did not even realize. And that's going to be the reality whenever you have other people maintain a farm basically for you. Uh, they won't know. And I don't believe that Kernel CI would be helping us here because, well, this it's just, yeah, it's machines, but machines like what configuration? Is it really good for your uh, system? Uh, when are the machines going to be available? You need all of this to be at your, um, like, it, it needs to be in control. And I don't believe that uh, the machines in kernel CI are ever going to be somewhat in your control. But then who's going to do it? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I have a talk about how to make it cheap <laughs> on Friday. I, have that. I still need to start writing. Uh, but yeah, basically, make it cheap. Because every, everyone, uh, pretty much every kernel developer has enough machines to start a CI system. But how do you make it? easy to maintain that's the question and uh and so I'm, I'm gonna explain basically what needs to be done sorry that's the doorbell of the dog <laughs> yeah i mean but then i don't i'm not sure that's necessarily the the problem because you know kernel ci is a mix of yeah like collabra bay libre all these kinds of ones where we sort of pay proper attention to it and maintain it professionally but then it is also a ton of um of labs in people's garages like um you know kevin hillman ran one for ages and that's how all of um a lot of them run lava a bunch of them run pie boot and stuff like that um and it's not that they haven't been able to um, put the infrastructure together for power control and UART and all of that because they have that and it works. So it's about, you know, it lives in their garage and when they go on holiday for a week, <laughs> the power goes off and you don't have results for a week. Um, so I, I don't think, like, yeah, having bare metal, like, really, or B2C or whatever, like, really easily available for everyone is great, but I don't see how that solves our reliability issue. Well, this is true that if you can emulate your hardware, that's that's the best. But then, like for driver development, I don't see how. Uh, I mean, there are some things you can test, but then realistically, like most regressions that we get are not in the common code, right? Um, I mean, Daniel Vetter would probably say the opposite. So maybe I'm wrong, but at least there's a lot of problems that are very driver specific and you just need a ton of hardware. And I don't see who else would be maintaining things except the project owners. But Daniel, the, the one thing I don't understand in your um, argument is um, how different would that be if we were to run QMU on the freshly compiled kernel just to make sure that the kernel boots and probably just spin up some kind of Durham video record. Um, we can do that really quickly with the infrastructure we have in place with the runners that we already have. It's just one extra job that we are running. How would that be a problem not to use kernel CI? Yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I think that's a perfectly fine and good thing to do. Um, it's just about how useful it is to, you know, test that 
VKMS probes, <laughs> right? When you're you're working on a Novo tree. But if you're working on a Novo tree, then you need to have a a form that is dedicated to Novo. Who is responsible for that? I don't know. Yeah, but exactly. We, we need to have people. Yeah. It won't be me. <laughs> for what it was. Yeah, I, mean, I don't see any other way than this, uh, than having people being responsible and then maybe at some point like getting the farm hosted more professionally. Uh, but then when whenever professional come in, into play, it means that they're going to do something else also. And so, I mean, there's going to be issues that indeed the farm is down and we need to react. So one thing that I was thinking about is we could have some uh, like a watchdog, basically. You have, I think it's 24 hours to give results and otherwise the job gets canceled and the pipeline is um, aborted. But what we could say is that um, like using a, a bot, just check if uh, the farm has not uh, you know, answered in let's say two hours then the runners, uh, some fake runners uh, are gonna run and just do one thing, which is saying basically, yeah, everything is good. You pretend the farm said yes. And then that's what it is. Like if the farm is away, then the farm is away. Uh, there's no concept of warning in GitLab, that's annoying. But at least it would not block uh, for too long. Why? Why are you trying to put some complex behavior when you already have everything in place? If the, let's say, if the nouveau farm that we have in place is not reliable enough, then we need to have another nouveau farm from the people who cares. And if they do not care enough to maintain their own nouveau farm, then they can just disable the CI entirely. I mean, the, the point is for, for my subsystem, which is input, which is completely different. I'm planning on adding my own runner and maintaining my own runner for the various things that I need to be done there. And I'll be the one responsible for it. If it yeah. falls, I'm the one responsible for it. Yeah, uh, the, I guess, the, again, missing context. I was thinking more about Mesa CI, where you know there's a lot of uh, shared code between the drivers. And uh, let's say a Red V developer is sending a merge request, and then there is the free Dreno farm being down, but the free Dreno should have been run because there were some changes to the near passes. Then, like, can we allow the farm being down to block CI? And then you, like, having to merge code to disable the farm is, I don't know, seems wrong to me. But if if the farm is down and regression is introduced is for the responsibility of the people maintaining the form or the code of the sub, of the subsystem that needs to, that, that person needs to actually um, be the one talking to the people responsible for the form. I'm not sure we need to have some complex way of handling oh if this form is done then we need we can use this one as a backup. I just oh, use... No, no, then if, if you had a backup, then by using tags, then you just you know, let um, the GitLab do the, the right thing, which is yep. pick another runner with the same tag. What I'm saying is if there are some machines that, if there are no farms available to run a job, then basically I would consider it as being a pass criteria. It's, well, fuck it. Uh, if I'm not available for testing, then I'm not gonna block everything. Just like in real life, if you are going on vacation for a week, then you, you basically accept that there's going to be development done when you are away. I would I would have a slightly different approach in which, like by default, we would say that the farm is uh, mandatory to pass, and if we realize that the farm is done way too often, we can put the job as uh, marking warning only instead of uh, allowed to fail. But can oh yeah, allowed to fail yeah that's that's how they allow uh, yeah. Yeah, but then there's allowed to fail, as in allowed to fail to get scheduled, and uh, uh, and then allowing the job to fail when it actually got run. Because when it got run, then there was no reason to allow it to fail. 
So it's, I'm not sure, like, it, it seems to be conflating two things. Not necessarily. Because if, if your farm is not reliable enough to be ready all the time, to pass all the times, then we shouldn't put some burden on the infra to ensure that the farm, I mean, if the farm is not reliable enough, it's the people responsible for the farm and their job is not mandatory anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that works as long as you don't have a hundred farms and, uh, um, you know, a couple of uh, hours of downtime per year per farm. Because then otherwise, like every farm basically would get, uh, I mean, the, the number of uh, merge requests that could be affected could still be in the tens or even 100 per year. Not necessarily. I mean, right now, we're going to introduce the pipelines. Uh, and we're going to, in the same way the Mesa pipeline was built up from scratch, we're adding things one by one. And when we deem them to be stable enough, then we mark them as mandatory. If they are not stable enough, and if they're not reliable enough, then we're just going to drop the thing from the farm and then from the CI and just tell the people, well, please do Make it better. Better. Yeah. Well, I mean, the organic way is, uh, is a pretty hard to argue with <laughs> way. Sure. Sounds good. I'm not super happy with that kind of policy because uh, there's a lot of drivers that don't even have a single developer. And that would probably be the most, the drivers that would benefit from the CI the most because they have the least amount of effort, uh, developer time and so on. So do we really want to put some additional burden that their form should be like 100% perfect? And if it's, if it's not that, it, that they don't care, basically, do we like really want to send that message across? The one thing, the one thing that you have to keep in mind, sorry for um, saying it that way, uh, is that currently the status quo, the status quo is that there is no testing. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, but if so, if we were to add those things, then we would need to have those people actually stepping up and say, Hey, can somebody help me doing that? And then we can discuss about it. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should not let people doing things and we should not help them. Uh, we can always reach the conclusion. But what I'm against is having an entire facility to account for failures and for all this kind of stuff when basically it's more of a social issue and more something like, yes, maybe we can, we can reach to a, to an agreement with that person. I mean, it's not um, on social, it's, it's also like practical. Um, some people are working on in areas that like don't have reliable internet or electricity or just going on holidays and don't have access to their infrastructure, whatever that is. Um, and things can fail. I mean, if, if you rely on someone that is basically working from home or a small office or whatever, you can't really expect it to run from a data center, basically. Yes, but that person can reach out to other people uh, in the admin team or in free desktop or in Intel or in AMD. And we can try to reach something where like maybe if it's if it's a single board that needs to be powered up, we'd be happy to have one at home. I don't have a I don't have a fiber connection, but whatever. Um, we can always reach out to some kind of compromise if that person is not cap is not able to run the CI by himself or by herself, that's perfectly fine. What I'm just saying is that I don't want us to have some weird complex mechanism to allow people to fail when actually, if that is that's important, then we need to put um, redundancy. As, redundancy as many balls as possible. Uh, for those reach out to the, I mean, it's never just one, um, it's never just one people. I mean, the, the board has been built by somebody and usually when we can try to contact the manufacturer of the board and try to see if we can get some extra hardware to put in some places around the world where we would be able to have that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was um, that's why I want to make it cheap to operate this uh, testing uh, farm because then we can have more people around, and if one farm is down for whatever reason, then then it's okay. But the, the problem is going to be that some farms are going to have are going to have unique hardware, and well, I accept uh, what Benjamin was saying that maybe what we need to do is just allow the the jobs coming from these hardware to just fail uh, i'd rather have it that you know it that it's failed to be allocated or to to get started but then if it is just allow fail then that's better than nothing yeah i mean allowing to fail or whatever was was completely fine for me the the one thing that i wasn't really in agreement with was um, the fact that if people can't make a farm reliable, then we shouldn't even care about that farm. It's, it's everything. It's basically all I was in disagreement with. Yeah, I, I, I guess the solution for this is if you can't get a farm reliable, just get more people to add. And then through the power of, uh, of uh, probability, it's way less likely that two or n farms are going to be down at the same time. The just part is the difficult one. Yes. What you said. Yes. Just need to get people to care. <laughs> but I mean, like, I don't know. Developers have so much hardware at home. But I mean, you need to get them to care. I mean, uh, what I'm saying in this is a social issue in that that person should never be alone in in its home, um, uh, even if it, if it's just a hobbyist. Um, there are people uh, who care enough uh, for the entire infrastructure, and could it be Collabora? Could it be uh, even Red Hat or this kind of this kind of people? And we we can still reach out. They can still reach out to, for instance, the admins of GitLab or Martin or anyone. We can try to 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 figure out something. Uh, we can um, always yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, where. We're generally pretty happy to, to take new stuff into into the Calabra farm, um, although it has to wait until we've rebuilt our office because it's got too big now. Um, the other thing is, yeah, the, the actual life expectancy of individual boards is pretty depressing. Um, so we don't, we don't do it for less than three boards, to be honest, because our experience with trying to do it on single boards is that you get maybe a year out of it and then it dies and it's not really easily fixable and you've sort of burnt all this time trying to to get it set up and get it vaguely reliable and then a capacitor goes and that's it <laughs> agreed to this now if you don't have like a way to replace the hardware then then that you cannot be reliable. But again, not being reliable, and if you have the job marked as a lot to fail, doesn't mean that you're going to be kicked out of the CI. It just means that it's going to be more work for the maintainers to, for the maintainer of those boards to actually look at the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like the way the, the Mesa CI is working right now. I mean, it, it, it took some time to ramp up, but at some point when we realized that there was something wrong in one of the machines, we just disabled the machine, the CI. And there is a new patch that is added, which says, well, just disable this one because it's flaky enough. And it could be that you just send a, there is a patch like, okay, this maintainer is on vacation, is uh, poor at home, just blew up or whatever. Um, we just disabled the farm for, for the time it's restored. Well, but have you been contributing to Mesa a lot? Because uh, at least some of the Mesa developers I know are very, very sour about uh, how often you know Marge uh, fails to merge because of whatever fucking reason. And I'm so yeah, they're it. wrong. <laughs> We've yeah. covered in Grafana, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, and plus, I'm most of the time responsible for those failures. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, but, but someone has to care, that's for sure. Like, it's not, uh, oh, I expose machines and then that's it.
But then even then, uh, let's say that, I mean, I care and I want to have the machines exposed and I want to provide uh, some value to developers. Um, if I spend more than half an hour a day on maintaining the farm, that's that starts being, you know, an acceptable cost. And if you're on call 24 seven, that's also something that is pretty bad. So this is why I was thinking that having a, a way to just be like, well, the thing is down, okay, uh, I'll just report. And it, this might be what I'm gonna do for my farm actually, just have a automated thing in the cloud that just when my farm is down, then I'll just accept everything. And that's, I think it's relatively easy to do and that would be something that is purely local to my farm. But then I don't really understand how this is different from, um, you know, you said it was a pretty hard no for the kernel CI model before, but now we're back to, you know, hours of latency and completely advisory results, which might not ever arrive. So, well, the difference would be that if it if after running my farm says no, there is a regression, at least it would block pre-merge. Whereas if you allow it to fail, then it wouldn't block pre-merge. And then, yeah, the farm needs to be available for the testing you want to do, yeah, that do agree. And that's actually one big concern that we have. How are we going to integrate with Mesa CI? Because the 30-minute um, latency uh, requirement is pretty difficult to reach uh, because not only is you need to do the testing in 30 minutes, but on top of this, you need to have been fully idle or you need to be able to run in, let's say, 10 minutes. So for instance, I have one machine uh, that is extremely fast, so I can run DQP in about 10 minutes. Very good. So that means that even if there are multiple jobs running already on it, then it's going to be able to go uh, quickly to this new, uh, to this um, Mesa March uh, testing. Um, but then when it's running traces, it won't be able to do this. So, at, I mean, at some point, I'll actually have to work on making, uh, you know, like uh, resumable jobs so we can just stop, uh, preempt it and do a more important thing and then go back. Otherwise, we're screwed. And latency is a big issue, basically. Mm. But that's that's also assuming that the maintainer cares about the results of the pipeline, right? Well, if they don't, then then what's the point of testing? There are. I mean, if if you consider that the results for the um, for the individual machines is floky or not. You can always so mark the jobs as a lot to a lot to fail and have the ones that you actually care the, the ones that are mechanical that are reliable enough uh, to be the ones that are required for the for the pipelines. But I, I don't I do not think that we are gonna have that we're gonna start enforcing the CI as soon as it's in mm -hmm. uh, for the Yeah, I do agree with this. That it needs to be more organic and just like a new developer needs to prove themselves, um, yeah. the farm needs to prove itself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's getting quite late now, so we are already over time. Do you have some opens you would like to talk about? So there was, for me, there was one thing that we didn't speak about for the traces that uh, could be interesting. That's um, uh, what to do with March and uh, and if a frame has changed, uh, what's the expected workflow there that we would like to have? Um, but does anyone have anyone else have something that they would like to talk about? Is the topic that I proposed interesting <laughs> to someone, or is this something that we should just do out of uh, uh, outside of this meeting? I mean, it's definitely interesting, but 
I'm not sure anyone has any good ideas about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only thing that we could do is basically have two stages of, of running, but that's, that's uh, a little crazy. Like you run it once, you check the outputs and then if, if there's no changes, then yeah, you can merge. Otherwise you need to go back and then have someone review the new frames and potentially change the, the reference frames or something and then ask again, but that's wasting a lot of time. I don't know. Yeah, it is, but that's the best we have right now. You know, you get in the EMR, you see that it fails, you get shown the traces side by side, and then if they mm -hmm. would then resubmit with the same expectations. But that is, yeah, again, assuming that they're actually static rather than <laughs> some kind of unknowable variance every run. Yeah, yeah, but then for this, then if we model the noise, then you add the new frame to the acceptable uh, to the pool of frames that are acceptable and then uh, ask to regenerate this uh, reference frame oh but that's also one thing then that means we need to store the reference frame outside of mesa which anyway is the case so i guess yeah it's no problem that's what i like with the idea of saying if a frame is acceptable it's not it shouldn't be tied to the mesa version it should just look from a human perspective is it good or not and then we can have the same uh, reference frame for every uh, Mesa version, and potentially even <laughs> every GPU and dry and uh, and manufacturer. That would be simplifying everything. Hmm. So we have been working on the website that allows you to do uh, this sort of uh, review. Uh, I. I hope that we'll be able to show you guys how, like basically our experiment, everything we do in this field is uh, research. So research and development maybe. So uh, I guess we just try and then see and give feedback and then, uh, then yeah, basically that's all I can see. Uh, just need to try. Okay, then I guess that's it for me.